Okay, so let's uh, uh, start this week's lecture. So we, uh, what we have basically, let's uh, kind of uh, review what we have done so far, right? So we, in the beginning, we learned the applications of aerodynamic forces, drag, and the energy consumption. And uh, uh, you're gonna have a homework due tomorrow that uh, uh, have the first problem focuses on drag and energy consumption. And uh, I'll have an office hour right after the lecture. So if you have questions, uh, uh, come ask me. And last week, we also started sensitivity analysis, right? We introduced uh, the concept of a fractional sensitivity and uh, uh, started, started using that fractional sensitivity for both applied aerodynamics and uh, uh, theoretical aerodynamics. We looked at what is the fractional sensitivity of the drag, right, uh, with respect to lift velocity and things like that. That's on the applied side. And on the theoretical side, we started using fractional sensitivities for thermodynamics of air, right? And then we started looking at uh, a particular case on the accelerating flow stream pushed by a pressure gradient. And we actually, at the end of the lecture, we derived something quite interesting. Uh, I'll actually redo it this lecture because we did it really fast in the last lecture uh, just to, to give you a very firm grounding of how the uh, non-dimensional Mach number jumps out of that derivation. So today we are going to start applying fractional sensitivity uh, in a really a broadening scenario, right? So. Uh, I'm, I'm here to give you a really general engineering and uh, analysis tool. All right, so in the future, I would imagine some fraction of you are no longer going to be doing aerodynamics at all, right? You may end up uh, doing something else, uh, managing an interplanetary logistics company or something like that. That sounds hard, but like you can use exactly the same kind of a fractional sensitivity analysis in what you're going to be doing, right? I mean, it's, it is going to be useful throughout aerodynamics, but it is also useful uh, in a lot of other places. So for example, we, we know that uh, induced drag scales like that, right? If you increase lift, the induced drag increases in a quadratic way. And uh, if you increase span, induced drag decreases in a quadratic way. So do you still remember, like, what is the fractional sensitivity of the induced drag? Uh, and induced power, right? Induced power is really how much power you have to put into the system to overcome the induced drag. So what is the fractional sensitivity of the induced drag and the induced power to speed? Can somebody look at the formula and now start telling me? What? Minus 2, right? So that's because we have a power of minus 2 here. So what do I mean by uh, the fractional sensitivity? That is d di over di itself, right? That is equal to what number times dv over v itself? All right? So that means if I increase my velocity proportionally by a small factor, like one percent, for example, how much would the induced drag increase in terms of also percentage? Okay. Now, uh, one way to look at this, uh, we didn't uh, say it explicitly last time, but it's still useful, is by taking logarithm on both sides. Okay. If you take logarithm on this side, you get log of di. If you take logarithm on, on on the right hand side, the Square becomes two times, right? On the right hand side, you have two times log of L minus log of rho minus two times log of V and minus two times log of V. Okay, now you take derivative to, log to the logarithms. The derivative of log di is going to be exactly dbi 
over dI. On the right hand side, because you have minus 2 times log of dV after taking derivative, you have minus 2 times dV over V, right? So that's another way of, of how to look at uh, this fractional sensitivity. That's basically uh, the sensitivity after you take logarithm. So we have minus 2. All right. So the answer to the first question, the induced drag, is going to be minus 2. How about induced power? There is another V term, but in order to calculate induced power, so PI would be equal to DI times V or divide by V? Times V, right? It'll be negative 1 because this V actually cancels with one of the squares in the V, so that is negative 1. Okay, good. A any questions on that? If no, can you think about the answer to the second question? What is the fractional sensitivity of the parasite drag and parasite power to speed? <coughs> right, that's the d naught. So what is d? d naught d equal to something times dv over v. That'll be 2, right? So the answer to this is plus 2. How about the parasite power? It'll be 3, exactly. Right? Okay, so that is actually uh, going to be 3 and plus 3, right? Okay, now the next question is something we didn't uh, do last time. That is, what is the fractional sensitivity of the total drag and total power to speed? So the total drag, of course, is equal to di plus d naught, right? So this is a, a usually the domain of non-fractional sensitivity because it sounds like it is easier, right, if you look at it in a non-fractional way. The incrementing drag is just equal to the incrementing induced drag plus the increment in the parasite drag, right? So that's easy. If you do it fractionally, it looks harder, right? So the total d over d, right, has to be a more complex formula uh, if you express it as a function of the fraction of sensitivities. But it turns out there is actually, it is more complicated, but there is insight coming out of this complication. All right, let's, let's do it. So d drag, that's the total drag over d, is going to be actually a linear combination of d di over di times something plus d parasite d0 over d0 times another something. So what are these factors? What are these linear combination coefficients? Right, so how do you go from here to here? Yes? It's actually, I think you're thinking too, comp uh, it's not as complicated as that. So D, uh, if, if you change both induced drag and parasite drag, for example, by changing the velocity, right, you are changing both. <laughs> so D total drag is equal to D, uh, Di plus D, D0, right? Okay, so, so basically, how do you go from here to here by kind of matching both the... Uh, basically, you need a factor, right, to, uh, to cancel out this and uh, put in this instead. Yes, <laughs> you multiply the first by a di over d and the second by d0 over d, right? Okay, so the... Uh, the coefficients are just uh, the proportion of induced drag in the drag decomposition and the proportion of parasite drag in that 
drag decomposition. Okay, I'm saying we have insight coming out of this because of why? Because we know that uh, the induced drag fractional sensitivity is equal to what? Minus two times the proportional change in velocity, right? So we have minus two times uh, dv over v times di over d, right? And then plus the parasite drag is plus two. So two times dv over v times d0 over d, right? So this and this is the same. So if we combine these, if we combine these, what we get is we have dv over v, right? The proportional, the, the, the uh, small percentage change in terms of the velocity. And then we have minus 2 times di over d plus 2 times d0 over d. So what does that mean? That means there is a condition over which changing the velocity would not change the total drag. And that condition is what? Yeah. Yes, that condition is that the induced drag and the parasite drag has equal contribution right, to the total drag. That's when you actually minimize the total drag. Okay, if you if you have a given airplane, right, with a fixed uh, uh, lift, I mean because you have fixed weight, you fix the density, fix the span, fix the everything except for the speed, right? And you're looking at what speed should I fly to minimize the total drag? The speed is going to be whenever <laughs> the induced drag and the parasite drag has equal contribution, right? Okay. So that actually gives the question, right? When flying at max range, the proportion of induced drag to parasite drag is going to be one to one. That comes out of that. Okay. How about? Well, uh, is there? Do, I mean, I know like uh, you have taken unified a long time ago, but like, uh, uh, do you, do you know what is the what is the relation between minimizing the drag and the max range? It, it did that in Unified, right? Yeah, uh, L over, yeah L over D, that's right. We are assuming we are fixing the, the weight of the airplane, right? So we, we are fixing lift. So maximizing over L over D is really minimizing drag. So, so what, what, what turns out uh, is that uh, if you're given amount of energy, let's say a tank of fuel, okay? So the total energy is fixed, okay? How much, how much range that energy takes you is going to be equal to the drag times distance, right? Drag, I mean, force times distance is the required energy to push whatever thing over that distance, right? So max range means maxing the distance. And if you are fixing the energy, you are fixing the drag times range. So maxing range means minimizing drag. All right. So that is, if you want to max range, uh, you are flying at equal proportion of uh, induced and parasite drag. A any questions on that? I mean, that just uh, comes out of the fractional sensitivity because the uh, fractional sensitivity of both induced and the parasite drag with respect to speed is either plus two or minus two, right? Now look at these numbers, power. They are no longer just a plus two and minus two, right? The fractional sensitivity of the induced power to speed is minus one, and the fractional sensitivity of the parasite power is to speed is plus three. So now if you are flying not for max range, but for max endurance, uh, maybe I should show you these numbers, right? Uh, Anyway, yeah, so if you want to fly for max endurance, what speed should you fly? Now, what is the proportion of induced and the parasite drag 
if you want to fly for max endurance. So, so what, what does max endurance mean? Just time. Just time, right? And how does it relate to what we are talking about? Power, right? So, so we know if you are given a fixed amount of energy, right? That energy can either be written as force times distance, drag times range, or power times time, right? That's the definition of power, right? Okay. So, so if you want to max endurance, max how much time you spend that amount of energy, you want to minimize. What? Power, right? Okay, energy equals the power times time. Energy is fixed. You want to maximize time. That means you are minimizing power. Okay, so now we know uh, the fractional sensitivity of the induced power and parasite power. The speed is minus 1 and plus 3. And the total power, of course, is equal to the sum of the induced and parasite powers. And you can do exactly the same kind of thing over here, right? So I can I can write it down. Uh, so if you if you do it with power, uh, I, I'm not writing under the right uh, uh, space, but uh, it's fine. So dP over P is going to be dV over V times what? Times what? Right, we have minus one times uh, p i over p, right, and then plus three times p zero over p, right. I mean, it's it's exactly the same kind of a derivation, except for just these numbers change. Uh, uh, any questions on this? Sometimes I, I get no questions because nobody understands what I'm talking about. Uh, is it this case or not? Yes. <laughs> so we, yeah, where I'm probably going too fast somewhere. Um, so so basically, the fractional sensitivity of uh, induced the power to speed is the following. So basically, uh, d p i over p. I right is equal to minus one times dv over v right, okay, and the d p zero that's what we derived uh, previously over p zero is equal to three times dv over v right, and the uh, and then uh, d p over p is going to be first of all uh, d p i plus d p zero over p. And that can be written as, in terms of, just a dPi over pi times pi over p plus dP zero over p zero times p zero over p, right? Then you substitute these two uh, in terms of dV over v, then you get this. All right, is that good now? Okay. A any questions? Still no. Okay. Uh, anyway, so so this is uh, this is how you do a sensitivity analysis to like uh, things that add together, right? Uh, what jumps out is the proportion of these uh, uh, contributing terms. And now, can we answer the question? If you want to fly for max endurance, what is the going to be the proportion of induced and the parasite drag? Three to one, right? Three to one. If you have three times the induced uh, uh, power, oh, not 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 the drag, but like power in this case. Uh, but it's 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 the same because drag is equal to a power divided by speed, right? So if pi is equal to three times p zero, then the whole parenthesis vanishes, which means changing the speed up and down by a small percentage won't change the power, right? That is called the first order optimality condition because changing something doesn't change anything else. That's either maximum or minimum or kind of settle point. Uh, in this case, it turns out to be the minimum, 
right? When you, whenever you fly faster or slower, you actually spend more power. All right, so, so this kind of uh, uh, insights just uh, jumps out of these kind of uh, fractional sensitivities. And uh, if you if you've uh, used uh, these kind of uh, things, uh, uh, fractional sensitivities, long enough, as soon as you start seeing these formulas uh, and uh, these powers, you can see that, right? By by seeing that you have v squared in the uh, 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 denominator and v squared in the numerator, both are squared, but one up, one down, right? You know. If you want to minimize the sum, the corresponding contributions has to be the same, right? Okay. Uh, another time when you look at the power, you see like one in the denominator is proportional to v, but the one in the numerator is pro proportional to v cubed. Then you know the corresponding contribution has to be three to one when you minimize something. Okay. So this kind of uh, uh, insights actually is going to be applicable not just in aerodynamics, but a lot of other places. Yes? Are those ratios are fundamental to all aircraft? These ratios are, yeah, they, these are fundamental to all airplanes at least. Yeah. Right? Airplanes, gliders, anything that, uh, uh, anything <laughs> whose induced drag and parasite drag is uh, like, has this simple relationship to speed. I mean, if you think of helicopter, it's a little bit different uh, in terms of the induced drag because uh, even at uh, the, the induced drag doesn't go to infinity when you slow down to zero speed. I mean, you, you have to analyze the induced drag in a different way. It's the, the wake is no longer left behind the helicopter. It just goes down, right, when it hovers. So, so if you think about helicopter and drones, uh, things are a little bit different. But for airplanes, gliders, it's all the same. Good question. A anything else? Any other questions relating to this example or in general uh, fractional sensitivity analysis? Okay, this lecture I'm going to go through the last example we did uh, uh, on the Mach number a little bit more slowly so that uh, uh, because last time I, I know I went through too quickly. Okay, and that was the last of the lecture. And then I'll have you work on something similar, right? But uh, even more, a little bit more involved than the Mach number analysis. I'm trying to have you actually derive not just the Mach number, but the Reynolds number, which is another fundamental uh, non-dimensional parameter in aerodynamics. So, the Mach number derivation is actually one of the fundamental things in aerodynamics that really tells you why low Mach number flows are called incompressible flows. And you're going to see what is really fundamental is not the Mach number itself, but the squared Mach number. Right? Whenever you are assessing compressibility, the Mach, the Mach number itself, okay, so, so if you go from Mach point one to mark point two, it doesn't mean the compressibility increases by a factor of two, no. It increases actually by a factor of, two, factor of four, right? Because what, what you're gonna see is that the, what is fundamental is actually the square of the Mach number. And that relates to uh, what we did the last Friday, right? Uh, remember, like uh, this is like a wind tunnel, right? Uh, uh, you guys were standing over here and they're trying to rush up to here, right? So, uh, Basically, we will say, okay, if the contraction ratio from here to here is 8 to 1 in terms of area, uh, I think Professor uh, Drehler was not satisfied with your answer that the speed also increases by a factor of 8, right? Well, approximately so, because the, we were operating at pretty low Mach numbers. But if you do consider the Mach number being finite, right, do you remember what the correct answer is? Do you speed up for less than a factor of 8 or more than a factor of 8? Huh? More, right? And why do you speed up by more than a factor of 8? Sorry? 
the air does get less dense, right? So remember, rho times u times a is the mass flux. That's fixed. All right? And a decreases by a factor of 8, meaning rho times u has to increase by a factor of 8. But does rho help or not help in terms of the increase in the velocity? You're accelerating by what? By pressure force, right? Because you're accelerating by pressure force, the pressure here is higher or lower than the pressure here? Well, you probably didn't feel it because we are operating low speed, but like if we're operating at high speed, you can feel the pressure change, right? Pressure is higher here and lower here, right? So as you are accelerating along, the, pr the, the pressure decreases, which decreases the density. So rho times u increases by a factor of 8, and rho decreases rather than increases. So u has to increase even further, right? More than a factor of 8. That's, that was the answer. But how much? What is it quantitatively? That's what we are trying to analyze in this study. Right? So uh, the first thing fundamentally important is what is the fractional sensitivity of the pressure to density? So, well, that's the first uh, question we need to answer for this study. And this is what is fundamentally different between this analysis and what I ask you to do in the homework. Right? What I ask you to do the homework is assuming I have a stream tube that's in a very efficient contact with something that has a constant temperature. So the temperature doesn't change. So the acceleration is not isentropic. Right? So here it is isentropic, while in the homework it is not. So you have to use the same uh, idea as what I'm doing here, but you cannot just uh, copy the answers because the answer would be incorrect. All right, so you have to actually understand what I'm doing here because uh, because it's it's actually going to be different. Okay, so so here, the answer of the fractional sensitivity of pressure to density is, uh, if you remember, we did the whole thermodynamics example, right? dP over P is equal to uh, actually gamma times d rho over rho, right? So that was uh, basically the result of this analysis, drawing this triangle on the uh, PV diagram, right? Having a slope of minus gamma, right? That's the result of that analysis, okay? Uh, of course, if you have a constant temperature, uh, this is no longer true. So you have to uh, do whatever after that in, uh, in, your, in, in your own way. Okay, so that is uh, uh, something we did last time, but like... Uh, what is the fractional sensitivity of the density to flow velocity? So here, remember, we have this momentum equation. We derive it by simplifying the Navier-Stokes equation under the assumption that there is no viscous force and uh, there is no uh, uh, the flow is steady state, so the partial derivative to time also goes away, right? And uh, we used the conservation of mass to derive this equation. This equation has three variables, right? We have, uh, it has three dependent variables that changes along x. We have rho, we have u, we have p. And this fractional sensitivity helps us eliminate one of the variables, right? After that, we just uh, get the relationship between u and rho, right, if we get rid of p. So let's do that. So if we do that, right, so, okay, so, so first of all, let's imagine we move along the streamline for a little bit dx. So if we move the stream uh, along the streamline for a little bit dx, what happens is rho u du plus dp is equal to zero, right? That's basically assuming a fixed dx. And to get the fractional sensitivities, we divide this by u, and uh, uh, we have to square the corresponding u in the numerator. We divide this by p, and we have to multiply a p also on top of it. All right, that's just the uh, algebraic manipulation. Now, this dp over p allows us to substitute this isentropic relationship. So uh, after substituting the isentropic relationship, we get rho u squared. Du over u, 
plus gamma times d rho over rho. Well, this p is still here, so gamma p times d rho over rho is going to be equal to zero, right? That's combining the uh, the property of air, right, in this isentropic relation with just the, simply the momentum equation. If you have something not air, right, the combination is going to be something different, but the uh, the the momentum equation is still the same. Okay. Now we only have velocity and density left. The fractional sensitivity of density to flow velocity can be just uh, uh, obtained by moving just this thing to one side and everything else to the other side. So the result is going to be d rho over rho is kept on the left hand side. Everything moves to the right hand side, right? And uh, oops. And first of all, uh, this has to be divided. So 1 over gamma p, and then uh, everything moved to the right hand side is going to be uh, getting a negative, so we have minus, and then we have rho u squared du over u. Yes? Yeah, the rows and p's. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, which... So like all of the of one subset of one is like not quite sure. Just like the gradient. Okay. Uh stick with a little let's see, maybe maybe the P sticks out a little bit more. Yeah, like like that. Is that any any better suggestions? Huh? Add a tail to the row like like that. Yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's a good. That's a good. Uh, uh, that's a good point. Let me do that. So here is row. Here is row, and uh, here is row. Anything else? I forgot to add a tail for. So here is a row, here is a row with a tail, and here is a row with a tail, and here is P. Okay, good. Anything I missed? No? Okay. So now let's figure out what is this guy. This guy is actually minus, uh, first of all, minus sign, u square divided by gamma p over rho, right? Okay, so that's actually defined as minus uh, u square over c square. So this uh, c, sometimes uh, uh, I think in some books uh, we use a to denote the speed of sound, uh, some books use C. I mean, like you should uh, actually uh, be familiar with both notations, right? So, um, and this is minus of the square of the Mach number. Okay, so this this is a so first of all, p over rho has a unit of uh, velocity squared can be simply seen from the momentum equation, right? So uh, we have p over here, but rho, okay, so in, in the in the uh, denominator, we both have dx, so same unit. In the numerator, we have p over here, but rho u square over here, right? So p has a unit of rho u square, that's something we should have known for some time, right? Okay, and uh, uh, then, P over rho should have a unit of velocity squared, and gamma is non-dimensional. It's one point four, right? For different gases, it's a different uh, uh, non-dimensional quantity. Just the ratio of two heat capacitances, right? Uh, a ratio of two things that has the same unit. So, uh, so this thing has a unit of velocity squared, but uh, uh, this is a very particular velocity squared. It's uh, it comes out both in this kind of a steady state analysis and also in an unsteady analysis on the propagation of acoustic waves. And it turns out that 
uh, this is also the square of the speed of like propagation of small disturb disturbances, which we may or may not have time to do towards the end of uh, 16100 to analyze sound. Right, so, so basically this come out to be speed of sound. And what is really remarkable is that, uh, well, first of all, like the, the significance is really minus m squared it is the ratio of d rho over rho to d over u. Right? If you accelerate a flow by 1%, how much does the density decrease? For a Mach 0.1 flow, if you increase velocity by 1%, how much does the velo uh, how much does the density decrease? Mark point one flow. For mark point one flow, right? Uh, we have this being what? What is in this parenthesis? negative 0 0.01 is minus m squared, all right? So if du over u is 1%, right, velocity increases by 1%, how much does the density decrease? 0.01%, really, really small, right? Really, really negligible change, okay? A, point, a, a mark point 0.2 flow, if you increase the velocity by 1%, uh, density would decrease by 0.04%, right? The effect is not linear, but quadratic. All right. And by the time you get Mach 0.7 something, a 1% increase in velocity has a 0.5% decrease in density. That becomes really, really important, right, in the analysis of flow field. So one particular uh, area in which it is important is the geometry of the flow field. So I uh, like maybe not by the end of 16100 but like if you continue taking aerodynamics at some point you are going to know how to read flow fields. You are going to if you see a flow field with streamlines annotated right you should actually be able to see what is happening and one of the uh, important uh, con components of being able to see the flow field right you have to you you will see okay which area the flow is accelerating which area has higher pressure which area has lower pressure just by just uh, looking at the streamlines and one of the important thing is is to uh, know if you have a streamline contracting or expanding, how does the velocity increase or decrease? And that, uh, that you need to know the Mach number because why? Because at different Mach numbers, how the stream tube areas, how the geometry of the flow respond to acceleration or de deceleration is completely different. Okay, so for example, looking at rho u, we know velocity increases along acceleration but density decreases so these are two contradicting changes right okay so uh, which one wins actually depends exactly on the Mach number at low Mach numbers rho doesn't change much as you increase velocity right so as you increase velocity rho u increases because velocity wins right and the stream tube would contract as you increase velocity. At higher Mach number, as you increase velocity, rho decreases really, really hard. Okay, and proportionally, if you have a Mach, if you have a supersonic flow, uh, increasing u by one percent actually would lead to a more than one percent decrease in density. So density wins in this in this. Uh, Kind of uh, uh, contradicting changes. So if you increase velocity, density decreases even more, and uh, the total effect of rho times u is a decrease, right? If you increase velocity, the mass flux per unit area actually decreases. So an increasing velocity means an expanding 
the stream tube, right? That's why, uh, anybody seen like a supersonic wind tunnel? Yes? What does it look like? Exactly, there is upstream of the test section, there is a converging diverging nozzle, just like what a rocket, uh, like, like a rocket bell looks like. Right? I mean, the same functionality as a rocket bell that's kind of to accelerate the flow from subsonic to supersonic speed. So anywhere you see something that accelerates the flow from subsonic to supersonic speed, you always see this kind of thing, a channel that contracts then expands. And this is why, right? This is why at subsonic speed, if you want to accelerate something, you have to contract it because as you accelerate, velocity wins, and uh, uh, you have to have it, the, the mass flow per unit area increases, so, so the stream tube area has to contract. But after you pass Mach 1, the same logic doesn't work anymore, because as you further accelerate, density decreases really hard, so you need more area for the flow to further accelerate. So whenever you see something accelerating subsonic to supersonic, you always see things like that. Right, upstream of a test section in a supersonic wind tunnel, right, in a rocket nozzle, and uh, uh, other places where you need supersonic flows. All right, a any questions on this? Okay, so that, that analysis also kind of uh, helps divide uh, uh, the, the several modules of 16100, right, in the beginning we are focused primarily on incompressible flows, the kind of flows where the Mach number is small. Well, that's not actually the most precise way I can see, say, say it. We are going to focus on the case where the square of the Mach number is so small that it is negligible. All right. So, so a Mach point one flow is actually very incompressible because the square of the Mach number is 0 0.01, right? You know that if I assume the density doesn't change, I'm only making a 1% error, right, in terms of uh, uh, any equation I'm looking at, right? If mark point 2, I would be making a 4% error, right? And you can decide uh, on how much uh, error you would tolerate in your analysis on what is exactly uh, your comfortable region of incompressible or not. All right, so that's really the basis of making a decision. Can I use incompressible flow to analyze things? That is, can I tolerate an error that is m squared? Okay, uh, so that's this analysis. Next analysis is uh, uh, really trying to also use sensitivity analysis to derive the second most important non-dimensional quantity. Uh, and if you're assuming compressible flow, that's the most uh, uh, important non-dimensional quantity in, uh, uh, in aerodynamics. That is the Reynolds number, right? The, uh, the Mach number squared can be seen as how important, uh, the, pre uh, how important the density would uh, uh, respond to a velocity change. The Reynolds number relates to something different, relates to how the velocity would change to viscous forces. So for that, we are going to be looking at a boundary layer, right? So uh, did Unified touch boundary layers at all? We, we did, right? Okay, so now we are going to look in more details about the momentum balance, the mass and the momentum balances in a boundary layer. Okay, so uh, I'm going to start this analysis and uh, I'll have you finish it. So first of all, we have to answer, um, okay, so, so first of all, let's consider low Mach flow, so incompressible. Let's say the density doesn't change at all. So density can be seen as a constant, right? It doesn't respond to any flow acceleration or deceleration. And second, uh, for our first analysis of the boundary layer, let's just uh, assume the velocity is proportional to distance to the wall. So basically, we have U infinity 
outside of the boundary layer. We're also assuming uniform pressure, right? So outside of the boundary layer, there are no forces. So, so the flow just uh, goes along at a uniform velocity with u infinity. Okay, and to assume inside the boundary layer, the velocity is actually proportional <coughs> to the I uh, didn't draw it very well to the distance to the wall. So we have like a a triangular profile. Okay, up to this point, which has a distance of delta, which is a function of x, uh, to the wall. Is the setup clear? to everybody like we have a velocity field just like that all right in, in the in the near the leading edge of this flat plate uh, delta is small and and uh, but wherever you you uh, you go we have this triangular velocity profile the linear profile so what's our uh, like curved black line oh the curved black line represents the edge of this boundary layer Okay. Right, so the velocity would be proportional to distance to wall inside the boundary layer, and outside the boundary layer, the velocity is just a constant u infinity. So inside the boundary layer, the velocity is u infinity times y over the delta, which is really uh, indicated by this curved line, the, the edge. Okay, and outside of it, u is equal to u infinity. Second given is the friction on the wall. Right in force per area. The friction basically uh, between the between the fluid, the air, and the wall tries to pull the wall right, <coughs> to move in the same direction as the bridge beam. And it pulls the air trying to move at the same speed as the wall. Right? So that's a, that's a shear force. I mean, a shear force means a force uh, across area that is in the perpendicular direction as the surface normal, right? That's a that's what we mean by shear force. No matter in in solid or in fluid, uh, the shear force, uh, the shear stress on the wall, right? I mean, when we call stress, that's force per area. That has the same unit as the pressure, right? Uh, is equal to mu, that is the viscosity of air or the fluid, <coughs> times the velocity gradient at the wall and in this case we're assuming a linear profile so the velocity gradient is what in this case mu times what is the du dy Is constant what? What is the constant? If u is equal to that, what is du dy? Uh, yes, it's u infinity over delta, right? Which is a function of x. Uh, all right. Okay, good. So, uh, to start this analysis, we need to look at conservation of mass and momentum. So conservation of mass uh, always has to do with how much mass flows across right, uh, a certain area per second. So let's actually just uh, uh, draw, just to cut the boundary layer at some point. Let's say at this point, right, at a particular x point, and ask how much mass flows across a cross-section of height delta and the span in this direction, let's say b. Right. At the end, uh, the b won't matter because no matter what b is, uh, it's, uh, if you double the b, everything doubles. Right. So, so in terms of uh, writing down a balance, it, it doesn't matter. Okay. The mass flux doubles, the momentum flux doubles, the amount of uh, a stress force on the wall, a shear a force on the wall also doubles because you're looking at the bigger area on the wall. So, so basically B is end up going to be anything that multi multiplies on both sides of the equation, whatever equation we look at. All right, so uh, how much mass flows across a cross-sectional area uh, of this much? Anybody can see it? Or you actually have to do calculus? Yes? Isn't this uh, one half uh, B into 
one half of b times u infinity. Uh, it's almost right. You get the one half right. Okay. It, it looks like you can do calculus. Uh, at least you can integrate a linear function in your head without writing anything down. So that's good. But the unit is not right. Huh? At row. That's right. That's we are looking at mass. And uh, you're also missing one other thing. Delta. That's right. Okay. So so how do we get this? We are trying to integrate over that area, right? The area is defined by this. Rho u times ds, right? And this ds can be written as, first of all, things are uniform in the span direction. So I multiply b on the end, and then I would be just integrating over the y direction of rho u dy, right? And now my u is a linear function of this form. So integrating a linear function would get me a half times what? Delta squared, right? And uh, well, one of these delta squared cancels with that delta over here. So I just uh, get u infinity times half delta. So u infinity times uh, a half delta over here, right? Then I have a d, I have a rho. So that's this. Is that too fast or it's okay? I mean, it's really. Depends on how familiar you are with uh, calculus and uh, things like that. It's okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah, if 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 uh, if this looks too fast for you, I would recommend just uh, go back and review your notes and uh, uh, just uh, do this a uh, little more carefully. All right. Okay. Now, uh, uh, this thing becomes a little bit harder to do in your head is how much momentum flows across the same cross-section per, se per second. So this is, uh, uh, this is m dot, right? And then uh, what is the momentum flux? I recommend you to start to write it down because I, I don't think uh, it's easy to now do this in your mind anymore. So we would be integrating a times rho u squared the ds, right? If anybody get an answer, just uh, uh, shout out. Yeah. Oh, row. Yeah, yeah. I forgot to put a tail on things again. Yeah, thanks. This thing has a row. Yeah. Yeah, well, we won't concern about pressure in this case because we are assuming a constant pressure, right? So the contribution of pressure to everything is going to be zero, it's going to be balanced out. Anybody got the answer? Yes? No? Come on, instead of integrating a linear function, just integrate a quadratic function, right? Uh, yes, right? So, so the momentum flux is one third of b u infinity squared times rho times delta. All right? So basically, uh, u squared, if you plug this in, is a quadratic function of y. And integrating a quadratic function, you get a one third, right? Okay, that's, everything else is the same. 
uh, so still, like you have a, a delta cubed, which cancels with the delta squared in the velocity squared, and uh, you come out to be this. All right, good. Now the question ones, uh, the the answers in one and uh, uh, two are going to really lead uh, an answer to question three. So how much momentum flows in the same stream tube at x equal to zero? What is the momentum defect? That is the difference in momentum flux from x equal to zero to x equal to x. So basically we are looking at a stream tube that goes from x equal to zero uh, because the velocity slows down, right? The stream, stream tube, remember subsonic flow, actually Mach zero flow has to expand, right? So, so the question is, how much does it, does it expand, right? Uh, that's, that has to do with answer to question one. And then, uh, how much momentum is contained over here? How much momentum flux over here? So first of all, uh, how much does the stream tube expand, right? If, if the if the height is delta over here, what is the height of the stream tube over here? Look at the mass flux. Right, mass flux is and here, velocity is just a infinity, right? How high does it have to be? to match this mass flux. Delta over 2, exactly. There is this factor of 2, right? That a triangular shape, on average, the velocity is slowed down by a factor of 2, right? So, on the, so the stream tube has to expand by a factor of 2. So this is actually delta over 2. Now the question becomes, how much momentum fluxes through that phase per second? And again, you don't need calculus because the velocity is constant, right? So u squared is constant. Well, it's just a, a rho u infinity. A rho has to have a tail. Rho, uh, this also has a tail. Yeah, rho infinity squared times uh, B and a half delta, right? That's how much momentum is upstream. Now, compared to how much momentum is downstream, that's the defect, right? Minus a third. Well, l let me just uh, write it uh, maybe in a bit more uh, easier to, in a bit similar way. So we also have rho u infinity squared. We also have a B, but we have a third of delta in the downstream momentum. So the difference is how much? It's one sixth, right? Times rho, uh, rho use infinity square, the B delta. Okay? That's, that's, uh, of course, I mean, this is assuming it's a triangular profile, right? In a realistic, in a more realistic boundary layer, uh, this number changes a little bit, but uh, it's roughly the same uh, same magnitude. Yes? Okay, can you say again, just uh, in which equation? Uh, here? No, the, the one for two. Yeah? Yeah, so why could we just divide that by two? Like, why can't we just like, divide it by two? Um, so, sorry, what is the basis for dividing this by two? Oh, this is different. So, yeah. So, so, uh, question two regards to how much momentum flows through here. Right. Question three asks, what is the difference in the momentum flux between here and here? Right, that's one sixth. And it's not asking how much momentum flows over here. So how much momentum flows over here is actually more than the momentum flux over here. Right? Although the area is smaller, but it actually contains more momentum. 
okay? So that's kind of a, a little bit counterintuitive because the velocity is faster, right? So, so a, a, if you look at the same stream tube, okay, the faster side, although it has a smaller area, actually contains more momentum because momentum flux is u squared, or mass, mass flux is proportional to u, right? So, so this has more momentum. Uh, the momentum here is one third, the momentum here is one half, so the difference is one sixth. All right, make sense? Yeah, okay. All right, so next uh, uh, I want you to spend the remaining uh, 20 minutes, try to work it out yourself. Uh, that's actually the wrong thing to ask. Uh, yeah, uh, what is the fractional sensitivity of uh, delta? Come on, to x. So basically, I want you to look at how the boundary layer thickens as I inc uh, as I move downstream towards the x direction. Right, would that? Uh, what insight does that give us? So the recommendation is to draw a control volume over here. So this is the control volume I recommend you to draw over a small delta x. All right, and look at the momentum balance over here. So the momentum balance contains what? Pressure force balances out because pressure is constant, right? We don't have to consider that. The remaining part is what is the external forces to the control volume? Friction, right? Skin friction, this is the only contribution. You have to multiply this by the area over which the flow receives that friction force, which is dx times d, exactly. So that's the only external force. And the external force has to balance what? Yeah, the total momentum flux, which is the difference between the flux over here and the flux over here, right? Okay, let's try to do it and uh, figure out what equation can you come out and uh, what kind of a fractional sensitivity can you derive based on the momentum balance equation. All right, so form groups of two to three and get started. Thank you. 